Bonjour, madame et messieurs, nous sommes ici avec l'acteur Jocelyne Zuko. Bienvenue, nous sommes tellement contents que vous êtes ici avec nous aujourd'hui. And everyone right now is freaking out. Because oh, on va like, pas le faire en français. On va pas, pas le faire en français, bien sûr. Ben oui. So, <laughs> Just to I'm celebrate the... the Habs going into the finals of the Stanley Cup. That's Woo-hoo. right. That's right. Go Habs, go. Surrounded by Habs fans, great. <laughs> well, you know, one of the uh, we are so lucky today to have the amazing Jocelyn Zuko here. And one of the reasons I really was very excited to have you with us, Jocelyn, is because not only are you a veteran actor, but you are a vector actor actor in two different industries in the English Hollywood industry, but also in the French Canadian industry. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that later. And I just wanted to pay a little homage to all our French Canadian listeners. Merci. Merci à vous. So we continue on. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to The Lazy Actor, the podcast that goes through all the great acting books and histories, takes out the key learnings, tells you some interesting stories, because you're too lazy to read this book, because you're too busy <laughs> learning TikTok dances to build your social media following, because you think that's going to help you. But guess what? You know what will help you even more? Audition by Michael Shirtleff. We continue our journey. And Justin, I know you had you read it. And one of the things I thought was really lovely is like, this is reminding me of a lot of things, you know, that I learned many years ago. It's the first acting book I ever read. It was mine as well. Really? I think it was a lot of people's first book. It's why we started um, the podcast with it. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Because well, but back in the 80s, Michael came to Toronto. Oh. And, and, and ta- oh, I took a workshop. I took a live workshop uh, with him. The legend. Yeah, absolutely. The legend. I mean, he was, you know, everybody wanted to be in his class. Uh, and it was around the same time that the book was coming out. So I don't think I knew an actor um, who did not have that book. It was the Bible back then. That's super interesting because, you know, mm-hmm. uh, I started acting, you know, maybe in the maybe like 10 to 12 years ago. And oh, I got beat. you beat by lots. Well, you know what? Let's you know what, Jocelyn, <laughs> you brought it up. Let's just jump into it. Forget the book for a minute. I have a very I have a very interesting question. Everyone, um, you can check out in the show notes. You can see Jocelyn's name and Jocelyn or Jocelyn, if you're depending on where you are in the world. And you will notice that Jocelyn is. He's got lots of different titles. Now, your first title, according to IMDb, says Telefrancais. And Tele in 1984, when you were, of course, eight years old, right? Mm-hmm. But then there's nothing till 1991. What happened? On IMDb? Uh, on IMDb. No, 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 no. It says, I think the it first, I think it says best known for, and I think no, designated I, I scrolled survivor all the way to the, the bottom. F- yeah, that's, that's at the top, but it, but it actually has your entire history. And Jocelyn, if you scroll all the way to the bottom, it says that you did one, one appearance in Telefrancais and then were embittered to- terribly to the industry. <laughs> and we don't see you again until Urban Angel, which I've never heard of. That is absolutely possible. Urban mm-hmm. Angel was um, really revolutionary for the time that it was in. It was a television series uh, developed in... Um, with Robin Spry and Jamie Brown with Telesign in Montreal. And they just relaunched it again on Encore Plus that people can watch for free because it's a 30 year anniversary. And so we, you know, they they let us know all of that, the, you know, the original cast of the show. And to watch it, what was one, to see yourself 30 years younger is a pretty scary thing. Like the hair, the hair in 1989 to 91, the hair was unbelievable. It is the storylines that they were tackling back then. You could have put that show into 2021 and it would have made perfect sense with regards to racism and the issues with the police and and violence against women and i mean it was sad in a way that 30 years has passed but none of these issues that were being discussed in this show 
are any further ahead in resolution 30 and years later. If anything, it's worse than it even was back then. So that was the one amazing thing, Two, <laughs> which you did, don't see a lot of. It was recorded in Montreal and people, depending on what their role was, spoke the language that they would really speak. So, so it's a bilingual show. It's not a bilingual show, but there is so much French. And what is very rare in English Canada television and film is the French Canadian accent. Yeah. Allowed to be spoken by in English uh, film and television. So that is another wonderful thing where, you know, it's in Montreal. This is how people speak, and it's very well reflected in the content of the show. So if anybody um, is interested, it's on Encore Plus. It's called Urban Angel, um, and it's a, it's a wonderful series. The lead was um, uh, Justin Lewis, who is Lewis Ferrara now that we um, it was the lead of the show. So that, that was really, that was the first big break that I had was playing the photographer on that television series. And I think it's very interesting when we talk about, because I want to talk about the break and uh, your big break here with that and, and bring it to the book here, because your character in that show, uh, you couldn't have come in and just played, you know, just random person. You couldn't have come and played at Vanilla. You had to make strong choices. And, you know, the first chapter the first part we're here to discuss is Michael Sherlock. There are no passive characters. That's right. the first. There's that little section. It says character qualities are of no use to an actor in an audition. Being mm -hmm. a photographer is of no use to you. Being security guard is no use to you. Being French politician is no use. You have to have a strong, he says, forget about weak or strong, aggressive or passive. There are no passive characters. There are no weak ones. There is winning and there is losing. I want you to think back. And if you can't do it for that audition, for that, for the show, for Urban Angel, if you could think on a, an audition you've had, whatever pops into your mind, where it was a role, but you had to bring something to it. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about audition and what you brought to it. Well, I, I think every audition you have to do that. Yes. Um, and if I, if I think of the, the section that you just talked about, I mean, you know, to be aggressive is 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 not as he says the best choice so what i i like to do is you know do i want to threaten that person do do i want to scare that person do i want to uh what is it that i want to do to them and then make the choice of how do i do that is it that i aggress them is it that i taunt them is it that i so i th i think that you can the emotion might come off as aggressive but it's because of what you're trying to do to that person to have an effect on them so I, that's one of the things that that i look at so if i even look at that photographer or i look at the french um, politician, which is the French prime minister on designated survivor, it's that a woman in that position has certain qualities about her to survive in the world that she is in. So then I choose to decide. So what makes her able to be able to confront the, the president of the United States? What makes her, what drives her what does she want to get out of that conversation? And then I go, I just go from there. Can you, can, can go let's go there. a little specific there. Sure. So in that audition, in the, or even as you were playing the character, you, you mentioned like, what do I want to get? Like, you know, Michael Scherl says it's about winning or losing. Suppose you're trying to win. What were you thinking and what were you trying to win when that audition there? Well, first of all, I have to be, you know, uh, honest with you, when I did that job on designated survivor, I hadn't worked in two years. Oh, I we're going to talk. The, we're going to talk we, about that harshness. I know exactly through, what you're talking about that drought. So imagine that you haven't worked for two years. So the idea of confidence is not really at the top of how you're feeling, you know, um, and then you you get thrown onto that. And it was quite the process from my not doing it to my being tell that. us oh tell yeah us. It's, a, it's an amazing story tell us all of it okay 
After so this, I, but first, let's okay. hold on. See, okay. there's so much. Okay. This is why I love Josh. Whenever you have veterans on, there's always great stories and things to learn. And the hardest part for me is trying to keep this show under 14 hours because I could just <laughs> talk to you all day. So let's let's focus a little bit. Okay. Uh, let's talk about the audition specifically, and then your journey to the part afterward. Okay. So the 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 audition was, uh, you know, the 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 one of the big two two of the uh, no one a part of the really big scene that's in, in the show. And she's from France and she's the prime minister of France. So there is the French accent. Being French Canadian doesn't mean that you're an expert in doing the French France accent the same way that if you're English Canadian doesn't mean you're great at the British accent. So that was one thing because especially being French Canadian and having all my French Canadian friends in Quebec, I thought I cannot get this wrong i need to have the accent be really 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 good and so, let me just intrude for a second for all our listeners french canadian is if you if you is very distinctive it is very distinctive from france french but in the industry here if you put that you can speak french you know even if we put on our resumes french canadian they're like okay sure uh you're a parisian photographer i had to do that two days ago parisian photographer and i was like Woo! talk to my call my friend in france to help no keep going so know. keep going it's, I mean, the difference between French Canadian and France is the same as English Canadian and British. It's yeah. just different, different accents. Completely. So I did the audition and I thought it'd gone very well. One of the executive producers uh, was there and then um, get a call from, from my agent saying that they wanted me to uh, go back in uh, but do something a little bit different with a certain section of it. So I went, oh, okay. You know, the executive producer had asked me to do it a certain way. I did that. I can go in and do it another way. So I did it another way, went in, did the callback live back then. Uh, and, and then I booked it. What I found out after is the network and, um, Mark, um, you know, the production company had said, no, we don't want her. And the executive producer said, no, you're making a mistake. She is the prime minister of France. If you didn't like what she did, it's on me, not on her, bring her back. Okay. And that's why I had the opportunity to go back and do now a different. So what was the it. difference and between the first it. and the second? I'm not sure exactly. You know, I think I think the biggest difference is I might have been a little too hard in 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 the first one in in my approach to to the dialogue. I'm kind of forgetting a little bit. So I just came in with it from a different angle what it was that they had asked me to do. Mm -hmm. I, again, it was but it was because he happened to be in the room and and fight for me that way like luckily i didn't know that going on and shooting so afterward or i would have been really 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 nervous going oh my god i can't let him down he fought for me so sometimes those little gifts can can happen and let me bring that back into something that will go back into the book a little bit sometimes as actors you know we think it, like if this is the danger like because everything he says and even in one of the things you read in this part that we're going to discuss is like there's exceptions to every rule i give you here everything because there's no rules there's just tools you can use and one of the things the danger is sometimes in your attempt to win you might go too aggressive on something you know what i mean you might go too on something and we're going to talk about this because he also brings it up in the book as well even when that happens, the stronger choice nine out of 10 times will still be better than the passive choice. And another thing he said that was interesting, and I think this applies here, Jocelyn, when you were saying less aggressive and stuff like that, because you're not an aggressive person. You sometimes come across as a little tough, but when I first met you, I thought you were so kind. And I oh, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, the very next part in that book we were reading, he says, the purpose of the reading is not to show who you, um, is to show who you are not to illustrate the character or what the you think the character means. So many, I was listening to Sam Rockwell saying, you know, I don't even know why he was saying like, I don't even know why I audition. Everyone knows what I can do. Like, you know, there's just certain things because of my personality, I can't do them. I will always do them this way because of who I am. And for very famous actors, he makes a good point. Mm -hmm. And 
you coming in, maybe that second time around, it was just a little bit more of you. Um, you know, for this show, I would say that, I mean, just a little bit more me. There's a lot of different types of me, which right now is great because in my career, I'm, I'm, I'm actually playing both sides. The characters are exploring both sides of, you know, uh, what I'm typecast as, if, if, uh, mm -hmm. if you wish. I just think that, you know, we, we as actors come in, I, I'm, I'm a big believer in a strong choice because you never know what exactly what they want, unless it's, it's a certain type of show like Hallmark, then you're pretty sure of what it is that they want. Oh, but even that a is lot a strong the, choice. It, it, it Slightly is, over but, the top. but you have to know the genre. You have to know yes. that that's, that's what that genre is. So I think that's really an important thing too, is you need to do your homework so that, that you know, you know, what's the tone of that show? You know, how are, you know, you watch the show, find out who the director is, look at the stuff that he's done. What's kind of does, you know, cause sometimes you look at the director and if you look at what he's done, it's all in a certain type of genre and the way he shoots it in the way that the, the, the acting is mm -hmm. in, 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 in the show. And I think that that, that can really help you, you know, going in. Um, read the dialogue how is it written if it's well written a lot of what you need to create is there for you look at the response of what the other actor is saying oh if they're saying that that means i need to do that for that to happen so a lot of those things can help you and then make a strong choice it might not be the right one but if it's a good person behind there looking at the audition they'll realize it's a good choice so and let's let's actually jump in right there because Oh, so sorry. Go ahead. Finish. Finish your no, sentence. That's it. They might bring you back, even though it wasn't exactly how they see it. And but that's not always the case. And that's the problem with self tapes and Zoom. You know, uh, they're not there. They're not in, there. In the book, he says, "I've heard directors say the actor did the scene all wrong, but he was so interesting. Let's hire okay. him." Yeah. Uh, and that's a that's an example of the concept of the strong choice. And I've come in to many. I'll tell. I did an audition once, and. This was one of my first touches, human target. No, the human shield or something like that. It was in Vancouver and they, they wanted, uh, I was playing one of two. I was, if, this is very typical. This is my last audition was literally, it's probably one of these two characters. So just read the line for both. Like that was one of those scenes, <laughs> but they're talking to each other. So I, you know, I record one as one and one as the other, and then they pick you for one of them, you know? And, and I, I thought to myself, this is supposed to be, I just made a very strong choice. I decided to do this. I decided that I was not going to, I was going to always wait three seconds before every line and just really, really try and be like very too much eye contact, like uncomfortable eye contact. That was my choice. And I did it. And in fact, the reader was like, the, the, remember the reader was like this and she, and she was like, said the line. She looked up at me and I just went, and I, I, did, I just looked at her. And then if we're, I counted to like 10 in my head and I remember, and everyone got like really still. And then, and then I did a line and then she responded back and I kind of looked around and I decided I was just going to keep doing it until the very end. And the director was like, that was crazy. That was so good. It's we, we, we can't take that long, but he was like, I love it. I love Like he was very excited about it, but because I made the strong choice, even if it, was, if it wasn't the right choice, yep. they're like, well, this person can do it. Yep. This person has something they can bring, even though it's wrong. Yeah. I don't agree with your interpretation, but I cannot fault your reasoning. Exactly. That's something I always say. Exactly. Yeah, I, 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 I really believe in that. And, you know, it's more fun. You know, sometimes you might not book for a long time. The auditions might be your opportunity to be the actor. So, oh. you know, give it, give it all you've got. And for me, like trying to figure this all out and, and that's, you know, what's the action here? What do I want? How am I going to get it? You know, all of that. That's I, I, I love preparing and, 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 you know, and doing that stuff. I love it. And I, I will say there's something that I want all the listeners to take from what Jocelyn just said. And that is when she said, if like finding the things and I'm holding the book right now for our listening audience, it's like finding the things in the lines, right? Mm -hmm. Because I was, um, I was in an audition for, um, this, you know, sometimes, Justin, have you ever had the audition where you're like, they're only seeing me because they're trying to negotiate a contract with someone who's very expensive because there's no way I'm going to be like the co-star opposite Tom Cruise for this. 
Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Have you ever? So this was one of those auditions. It was like for the main bad guy in one of the Chronicles of Riddick. And the actor before me, I think the trap is just decided to go really big, but without any justification in the lines. Without mm-hmm. You know, sometimes as actors, we're like, make a strong choice. Fine. Uh, I'm doing jumping jacks the whole time. And it's like, but why, dude? What, 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 where is that? How does that help? And I will never forget. I could hear because he was like, like he was, he sounded like, um, remember the rooster from Warner brothers, uh, two cans. Yeah. That's how he did it. And I remember afterward, the, the, the casting director came out. It's like, I'm, I'm going to need a break. I need, I need a few minutes. He was, they were trying, they're like, thank you. He's like, yeah, you know, I'm just trying to make strong choices, man. I'm trying to make strong choices. He's like, okay, no worries. Thank you very much. Which brings me to the next part where he says bursts of anger and regret after an audition are significant signs that, because there's that happens so much, right, Jocelyn? You'll see with newer actors, with, they'll be like, fuck, I messed it up. Fuck, 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 fuck. They, they get so upset. And that's usually because they tried to please. They didn't just try and bring what they thought. They didn't do the work. So they just made a big choice and it didn't work. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, you have to, you have to do your homework. And I, I think you may learn that with time. It's that, I've learned not to be angry with myself after an audition um, and just put it behind me because I prepare very well. Like when I go to an audition, I am very prepared, whether it's the self tape world now or I go live. So I can honestly leave and say, it's my fault. I should have prepared better I shoulda I shoulda I shoulda I never say that because I did everything that I could do and you know he talks about in that section that actors will do a scene and get really upset with themselves there's two things to think about with that and I want to get your perspective on it one he says that usually actors are most more interesting in when they're talking afterwards because they have so much emotion And he says, you should be using that nervousness and tension in your performance. Mm -hmm. I'll be honest with you, John. I'm a little iffy on that because you're not necessarily feeling those things until after you feel you sucked. (laughs) So I don't know. I've tried to use my nervousness or whatever, but the concept of preparation is very, is very, very important. And what I want to actually ask you about then you, the ability to leave an audition behind because you did a great job. That, that audition that I did with like the long silences, the direct, and this is a director, and this almost never happens. He was in the room and he was like, hey man, he shook my hand. I'm like, that was, that was great. That was something. And the, 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 the and I'm bragging about myself here. The, the reader was like, dude, you freaked me out. That was intense. That was so great. I think you got this, right? I didn't get it. But I felt so good after the audition yeah. because that's our job is like doing good auditions that I didn't care because I think I really brought something to that role. Leaving feeling like you did a good audition is probably the most important part. And you say you really prepare. Can mm-hmm. you walk us through? Let's, let's, let's all learn from Jocelyn and copy her techniques. Tell us what do you mean by you prepare really well. Talk. I, I want to know the things, the physical actions, the physical things you do so that we can learn from it. I print it out. Okay. You pr- so you're not, I print you're, not out the you're not on the phone. You're not on phone. No, you always print it out. I always print out. I always, always okay. print out. I, you can't, you know, you, you scroll. No, 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 no. Okay. So the first thing I do is I print it out. Then I get my yellow highlighter and I highlight my lines. Okay. Then I will usually right away look up the producer, the director. If it's a series that's already on, uh, television or on Netflix or whatever it is, I will at least try to find it to, to watch an excerpt of the show to really get a tone um, of, you know, what that show is. Because, you know, if you're doing The Good Doctor or if you're doing Fleabag, well, it's 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 it's, it's different. different. It's, yeah. it's different, it's right? Different the, yeah, there's a different sensibility and all of that to, you know, to the show. So that'll be, so those will be you know, the first things that, that I will do. Then I will read it over and over and over again in a very neutral, you know, kind of way, really trying to pick out uh, words, things that I say, things that the other character says to try to get a sense. I will also 
read in the breakdown, I will read the character description, not only of my character, but of every character that I'm involved with in the scene, whether they have one line or 10 lines. Just really quick, Jocelyn, I want you to continue. Yeah. But when you say you read it over and over and over again, I just want to clarify for our listening audience, because I know I think I know the answer. Are you reading just your lines or are you reading all the lines? And are you also all the lines? And are you reading the stage directions and everything, too? Or are yep. you just focusing on lines? Yep. So I you're just, read it, you're I reading just, it like a novel. You're reading it like yep. a novel. Everything I'm reading. Read. I'm reading the scenes. I'm reading the scene over and over again with with everything. And of course, because we are on, you know, self tape, a lot of the directions, if you wish, have to go out the window because you 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 can't you can't do them so then i try to say okay well they would be doing that action because of something that's going on in the scene so then i will try to see well what can i do to give the impression of yeah. what they're asking for so i will try to say you know what action can i do what physical action can i do to you know to to make that happen so that will be, you know, that'll be the beginning. And then I start breaking it down. What are the beats? What do I want? You know, what do I want out of this? And then I just rehearse it over and over and over and, and over how do you rehearse? And over again. Just by myself with my paper in front of me, the old fashioned way with, okay. you know, the other paper to hide the other lines and away you go. And one thing that I do is I will read it, you know, once I know it pretty, pretty well. I will just read it silently. I will read it over just before I go to bed. And then I will do the scene in my head as I'm falling asleep. Like running the lines like, in your head or yeah, like kind of yeah. pretending to imagine the, it? Yeah. I never have insomnia when I'm working on something because I go over the lines in my head and that puts me asleep. I think it's because it's a, it's a focus thing. Um, and then and then I tried to decide, OK, what would this person look like? What would she wear? What are her colors? Uh, you know, is she well dressed, not well dressed? Is her hair really nicely done? Does she wear a lot of makeup? Does she not? Does she? So I, I you know, bring that into it, you know, in, into it as well. Um, so it's really a combination of all of those things, all of those things together. You know what? One of the things I like to do is I print out my lines whenever I can. Um, I actually don't own a printer right now, so but, but I have to buy a new one. But whenever I get auditions, if if there's more than just a line or two, um, I will print it out and I carry them in my back pocket everywhere. And what I do is every time I meet someone, like let's say I'm going for a walk with a friend or a drink for a friend, and I've, I've become notorious amongst my friend group for this, I'll be like, hey, listen, can you just can we just run these lines a little bit? And I, and I run them, and because here's what I find helps me a lot diversity of delivery and location mm -hmm. so i'm in a bar with a friend and we're trying to talk the lines even though it's me be, be, me and a girl in bed boom gives me something different to work with yeah on the street and i have to yell but the guy's like dude don't you know we're, we're, i'm not an actor dude right um at my friend's place uh on a bicycle like everywhere and that gives me like this ref different diversity of ways that i can think about delivering and listening absolutely and you just reminded me um uh, it was with Carol Rosenfeld. I was studying with Carol Rosenfeld and we had to, I had to do the scene. It was Robert Morelli who I was doing the scene with and we were rehearsing it in, in my apartment is, you know, um, so he came in and we were rehearsing, you know, doing the actions of the scene as it's written and so on and so forth. And then we decided, scene, everybody knows it was a love scene. No, it wasn't actually. <laughs> It was a fighting scene. Uh, Ooh, it, was, uh, it, 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 it was, um, oh, they made it into a movie. Now I'm forgetting. Oh, Mamet, Mamet. It was Mamet. Uh, Hurley Burley? Yes. And we, so what we did is, I, we did the scene while I was chopping vegetables and all of that. And then we did it that we were talking. We went to the 7-Eleven at the corner of St. Clair, and and Bathurst and we did the whole scene while we were getting stuff in the 7-Eleven we were arguing while we were cashing our food out and everything we were just like in our bubble doing the scene as we went I will never forget that I will never forget that and and what a difference it made because of exactly what you you just said we you're were putting your performance in the real world. 
Yeah. It you know, was uh, really, really, really cool. Really, really cool. You actually remind me that, you know, I was with, uh, I was doing a scene, preparing a scene for an audition and I was in the kitchen and I was literally trying to cook as my friend was feeding me her lines. And I remember because it, it did two things. One, it gives you this, it helps you like bring it to life. But two, when you practice with distraction, you're preparing for being nervous because you'll know what line you'd be like, oh, like, what's that line? Just something, stirring something, you're like, and it's gone. You've been looking, reading it for three days, but now that you're stirring, it's gone. But that distraction gives it life, but also reinforces the lines. And what it also does is it gets you out of your head. I did a play yeah. once where I had to live on stage. I had to cook an omelet and make toast. Your focus is not about what's my line. It's making the toaster okay and that they're buttered and that the egg is cooked because you're going to give it to an actor who's going to have to eat it. So you've got to turn it on. You've got to cook it. You've got to put the salt. You've got to do the stuff. You've got to go put the, the thing. You have to. That's what you're thinking about. Yeah. And that's very liberating because. Once you can do it with those actions and the lines just come. Yeah. That's how you, that's how you, I tell people all the time, you need, practice with distraction because if you can be doing push-ups and Pilates the whole time, having, a, yeah. uh, doing your lines, I mean, that means it's there. That means you're not yeah. thinking about lines anymore. And, you know, and it can be, I, I'm just, I'm thinking too, um, uh, a series that I did in, in Montreal and there was a scene where my, my son comes in and I tell him I'm an Italian mama, Angela, la mama. And I'm going to make lunch for him. So it's this whole ballet that he sits down and then I go in the fridge to get the pasta. I turn on the microwave. I put that in the microwave. I go get the knife and fork. I get that. I go get the, the napron there. I forget the French, you know, placemat. I go get the placemat. I go put all of that. So it's like, that's, that's what you're thinking about is the choreography and am I doing it the, the, the right way? Or I had to take peppers out of a grocery bag and throw them as I'm saying my lines. But of course, for continuity, you've got to get the same color pepper in the same order and you did throw it, the it at the same time. word and th- be yeah. like, that's why you can't, and you can, so you can't be, that's why I want to go. You have to always be at that's why. So and that's what you're thinking about. You're not thinking about the words you're thinking about all of that. And sometimes that's when the best moments come in because you're just, you're focused and you're being completely real because you have to be in the moment. And you know, what's interesting about what you're saying here, Justin, is that this whole concept of, of doing these actions, it's actually something Julian Ritchie said. Sometimes when you have a hard time figuring out how to deliver a line, don't stop trying to figure out how to deliver a line. Oh, just yeah. What actions are you doing? Oh, and then the absolutely. Line, and, then just, and then the lines just come. Do you know oh, what I mean? absolutely. It's like in real life. Yeah, you're not thinking, right? of, like you're saying things, but it's what you're doing that can give those lines uh, yeah, because life. of what's going on, because of the situation, because of your yeah. relationship with the other person, because of what you're feeling right now, right? How and and um, another amazing teacher that I had that really I owe who I am as an actor now, I owe it to Warren Robertson. A hundred percent I owe it to him. And his thing was always activity in business activity in business. Yeah. What are you doing? What are you doing? That lets everybody know how you're feeling about what you're saying, what you're doing and how you know? you're doing it. Yeah. I mean, you can be setting a table 15 different ways and the way you put down the knife and the fork or, you know, put the food on the plate is going to say a lot about what's going on emotionally. And, and I've always hung on to that. So I am very, uh, centered on activity. What am I doing? What am I yeah. physically doing? So I'm a prop actor. I love props. I love doing stuff. I think that it's very helpful. And le- there's, I think for all our listening audience, uh, for all our newer actors who are thinking about their acting process, how to be an actor and stuff like that. This is why, you know, starting out with theater, I, I've always hated the excuse. People say, oh, I'm a theater actor. That's why I'm so big. I'm like, no, that just, that doesn't make any sense because the beauty of theater, it's not being big. The beauty of theater is like, on a, on a TV film, on a shivy set, 
they'll you're filming like three seconds. It's just, Hey, can you just throw that and say that one word? And you're like, yep, here you go. Yep. One more time with a little more. Yep. Here you go. You're doing these tiny little actions and tiny little moments. Theater teaches you that the prop, the physicality, because it's 15 minutes long. So cooking dishes is not just I'm coming. And then the scene's over cooking, like, you know, making food and then doing all the intricacies and the involvement that you're mentioning is something that a lot of our actors can learn by doing theater because of the longer context of the scenes. Mm -hmm. And do it for yourself. Even if it's a short scene, decide what am I doing and how am I doing it? You know, I think physicality is, is, is huge in interpretation. I mean, somebody can say, I'm telling you the truth, or they can say, I'm telling you the truth. And even just, wow. in your, just, just by, so everyone, just for the, the, the listening audience, they all heard that difference, but that difference came from Jocelyn once just being very still and twice shaking her head. No. And that little action told us so much and it actually affected the delivery of the line. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let's talk actually a little bit about uh, about another type of physicality, Jocelyn. Sure. Um, what's your favorite drink? What do you go? What's your, are you a wine? Are you a wine lady? I'm going to say. Uh, I would say I yeah wine. Well, if I had my choice, it would be Cristal Champagne. That oh. would oh you know, oh Madame would, oh Madame that, that would be if I had a choice. The Cristal that Champagne. Would be, that that would be what I would. Uh, and then after that, any champagne. And then after that, crema. Then after that, Prosecco, and then after that, white, and in the summer, rosé as well. And oh. I really like the, the new, there's like bubbly rosé now. Yeah, the carbonated rosé. Or the mixture of Aperol with, uh, with Prosecco <laughs> is also very good. Not that I consume much. How, how, how European of you. <laughs> Tim, what's your drink? I see Tim just jumped in here. All of the above. No, <laughs> I'll tell you right now. Tim, Tim is like, what's on sale? Boom. <laughs> what's on sale? What's this? What's I don't care. Can, does it come in a straw? Done. That's right. That's right. And a paper bag. It's got to come in a paper bag. When so we reason- were young, we used to, in teenage years, uh, when we were drinking beer, we used to put a straw in the beer bottle because someone had told us that if you drink the beer with a straw, you'll get the effect of the beer quicker yeah and more yeah I, I remember that as a kid air comes in i i don't know uh and what if you're hearing now true. audience is science we are now a science yeah, that's right we're now science people yes <laughs> the, the reason i asked is because there's and i thought about you know in my first acting class at the william davis center in vancouver british columbia and for anyone who doesn't know william davis was cancer man on the x-files the guy who's always smoking oh yeah that's william davis and so he had this little instant, this shitty little building, like a tiny little in like a kind of a, a it's now a nice part of downtown. But at that time, it was like there was a halfway house across the street. And there was always like crazies around he Had this little kind of rundown little like two room, two room acting school. And the first time I had to play drunk and Michael Shirtleff talks about being like uh, there's only one reason why characters drink. And the first time I had to play drunk, I fell into all the tropes. And so. I started slurring my words and I was <laughs> and getting really liquidy and like slouching over. And Michael Shirtleff says that when you do that, you're actually not doing anything. Uh, you're actually being self-indulgent. You, if you look at relationship in order to mumble or meander, it's highly self-indulgent. Um, actors tend to use drinking negatively. It's important to find the positive in the drinking. And the biggest reason, according to Michael Shirtleff, he says in in when we are actors, the reason the writer put in drinking was not so you play drunk. It's because, and I want you all to think back about high school and the first person you liked, you used the drinking as an excuse to be more candid, to l- free your inhibitions. So before I say what I do, I'm going to ask um, Tim, because he's an alcoholic. I don't know if you know that he's a functioning alcoholic. I'm going to ask Tim and then I'm going to ask Jocelyn. When you have an audition or when you have a role that requires a drunk character, what do you do and how do you play it? Tim McClarty, RadioRadio.com, producers of this podcast. I I got a quick story I'll tell you. Uh, Years ago, I did a scene study uh, program and uh, there was a, 
another young actor at the time. And we had to do just exactly that. They asked us to do a drunk scene. And so we went home and uh, read the scene, memorized the lines, came back in. And didn't the guy show up to class drunk? <gasps> and we were doing our scene and he didn't have full uh, faculties? Contr control of his faculties. So uh, there was a wrestling scene. I got thrown into the wall. And the teacher just tore a strip off him like you wouldn't believe. And she said, there's a reason we call it acting. You, you don't yeah. come, you don't get drunk so that you're a convincing actor that is just idiocy and dangerous. And I'll, I'll never and forget that. Listeners, never, never go that crazy. If, if your character is a crackhead, don't smoke crack. If your character is drunk, don't drink. Never show up with alcohol or weed and smell. So how did you play then, Tim? Like how did well I, I don't know who, maybe it was you that told me this, but uh uh the 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 key was to try and pretend you're not drunk. Uh to work very hard on focusing on saying your lines clearly because you don't have complete control of your faculties. And he did it just then. And it sounded a little off, but it didn't sound drunk at all. What well, bravo, because that little off is what we're going for. I'm doing fine. How are you? Jocelyn? I've I've never had to, to do it, uh, but my approach is exactly what Tim just said. When you're drunk, you're trying to pretend you're not. So whether you're walking or you're eating or whatever it is that you're doing, it's trying to not be drunk. And so I that, be, that would be the, the, the approach that I would bring, but I've never, I've never been asked um, to do that. So I played an alcoholic father in a short film. It's called Like a Fish, because they drink like a fish. Um, a side note, this kid looked nothing like me. I'm beige. I look kind of Mediterranean-y, I look Latino, I look Persian, that kind of stuff, right? This kid was blonde haired and blue eyed. <laughs> And I'm happens. like, you know what? Hey, now, that's all right. Maybe my wife's that way. Maybe my wife's that way. Who cares? So, but what I did, I did two things. Um, in the audition, I played it totally straight. I played it like I, I took alcohol out of, you know, Justin, how you said in your audition because of self-taping, you take all the stage directions out. I tend to do that no matter what, because in an audition, you just can't like unbutton someone's blouse or, or, or throw a hoodie on, like things like that. They're distracting. So I did the whole audition just like this, just normally. But I tried to make strong choice about how I felt about the other person. And they loved it. I actually booked the part because of that, because everyone else had been like, listen, you don't know what you're talking about. No one who's that drunk, no one who's drunk really talks like that, that much. And then I had to do like scenes about physicality drunkenness. And you know what I did? Because Tim, you know how you say deliberateness? I flex my butt cheeks. That's all I did. I, I just squeezed my butt cheeks while I walked because it made me be much more deliberate. And so it looked like I was trying to, it looked like I was trying to walk. I was fine, but it looked like I was putting too much effort into walking normally. And that made me look, they're like, it was just, it was a little off, just a little off. That's great. So Jocelyn, if you ever have to play drunk, uh, please remember to squeeze your butt cheeks. I will. <laughs> I will. And uh, let's go. So let's go on because, you know, um, there's so much I want to talk to Justin about that we haven't got to. I want to talk to you about the industries in Quebec and the rest of Canada. The ind I want to talk about playing type and being typecast and stuff like that, because that's a constant theme. And, but before that, let's go through some more things that we learned from Michael Shirtleff. Sure. The first thing is I'm going to try something on you. I, you know what? Because I know Tim hasn't read it and you have. Let's mess with Tim a little bit. Uh, so, Tim. Look, look at me. Tim, look at me. I'm here. Okay, here we go. Tim, what were you doing around this time last year? Like on a week, on a Friday? Oh God, I was, I mean, that was pandemic and full uh, steam. So uh, probably over at the, the gal's house uh, making dinner. And I think about this time we would go out on the balcony and people were still hammering pots and pans. So that was kind of the highlight of the evening. Just so you know, Tim's single. He's making this up. It's totally no one would ever love Tim. I'm just kidding. Tim, his girlfriend hates me because I'm always mean to him. But I love Tim. So actually, now here's the here was the exercise. Because in Michael Shirtleff, he said he talks about remembering. 
And Tim did it. We all do this naturally. He says, he said, he has, what were you doing three days ago? And what does, what did Tim do? What do we all naturally do? You were trying to imagine it. You were trying to picture it. You looked away and you're like, oh God, where was I? And you were, you weren't thinking of words. You were seeing specific things. Is that correct, Tim? No, like absolutely. You, you were probably seeing, looking out your balcony and watching people. You were seeing the girlfriend's house. You were seeing the girlfriend, et cetera. And that's what Michael Shirtliff talks about. Um, um, acting is seeing. In a monologue work, in monologue work, where actors have such trouble seeing their imaginary partners or seeing other imaginary people in the scene, it will help if they could see an environment. Jocelyn, do you use imagery and association, and how do you work with? Oh, very much so. I always, uh, it's always easier when uh, before. Let's say when you when you book the part and and you know you're getting ready to 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 shoot and you're rehearsing all of your scenes. What's so great is that you now know what that actor is going to look like that you're playing the scene with. Mm. So when I'm rehearsing out loud by myself in my living room, I have something there, and then I'm looking at that person. Like I will visualize them in my in 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 my head so for an audition i will either pick people from my own life or just come up with an image of a what i think this person might look like and so i talk to them but i absolutely i absolutely create that which is why i even create a physical world when i'm auditioning uh, uh, around me and what do you, let's elaborate on that what do you mean by create a physical world are you well picturing something like what is can you give us an example let's do that can you give us an example of, of a time you've done that yeah like for example um let's say oh so this upcoming uh french canadian series i play this fabulously older woman who's just full of sunshine and she's just all the way really really happy so i i created where you know, she she's sitting on a bench and there's this going on and somebody comes in and they give her a pot of flowers and she's really happy about it. And she's got to sign a paper and there's, you know, that's kind of a key thing in the scene. Well, I, I did create that and I had different benches and stools oh. and, and things. So around that, the house. Yeah. And then I brought them around me because, you know, the camera is recording you here. So I rehearse it so that everything is accessible so that I don't, you know, I'm not out of camera range, but I'm able to bring in the physical activity to, to what I'm doing. I love it. So I will bring in my props and just put them where they need to be and figure it all out so that it can work. There was even a thing, it was for a commercial where we're supposed to catch something. So what I did is I put it just a little out of range where I could take it and throw it at me, at myself. So, oh, so you took it and kind of and, and caught it with the other hand. It. Yeah, right. And I'll so, and, and I find that, you know, bringing all of that does, does help me. And I'm gonna throw something else out, gang. Um, I just, uh, Justin, Justin and I have the same agency. So I don't know if you got this for this, some commercial where you had to like, uh, be interrupted and ask someone takes you a picture of you. No, no. Okay, it might have been. Is it, I felt like it went to everyone in the roster because it was like super open and I don't know. Oh, but it was Latinx. That's probably why. Hence the parts I play, all Latin stuff. And it was you're doing something and you're interrupted. Someone says, "Hey, can I take a picture of you?" And you say like yes, and you look very proud. There's no actual lines. I think nine out of ten people would just be on their phones. And if that's dear listener, if that's your if that's your go to, think of something else, because uh, I just think that that's so that sometimes that that's the default, right? That's the default nowadays. Is like oh, I'm on my phone. They're using that as their prompt. Find something else. Create a physical environment, like Jocelyn was saying. I was I in, in the audition. Just just as a fun fact, I decided that I was going to be in the middle of a dance step. Because I dance. I don't know if you know this about me, Jocelyn. I'm a, I moonlight as a dance instructor. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm a big dancer. So I just started doing a few dance steps. And then I, then I pretended that someone was interrupting. Like, excuse me, can I take a picture of you dancing? 
Like that's what I heard in my head. That's right. creating the reality. And yep. I actually pictured a pretty girl that I have a crush on in the, like right now in the moment, there's this pretty girl that I have a crush on. She lives in Vancouver. And so I picture her saying that to me. And that's what Michael Schur left his song about having real, like really thinking about real people and seeing those people. Yeah, absolutely. And Let's, the one oh, thing I will say though, you know, when we're alive again and we go know who you're auditioning for, because if you are like me and you're a proppy actor, they don't all like that. <laughs> so true. make sure you don't know, like props. Yeah, make, make sure, sure you know who you're going in for and whether they're okay or not okay. <laughs> oh, you know what? That reminds me. I got to bring in my the best prop per thing, the most crazy, insane. It's I have a friend of mine. His real name is Ken Lucky, and we were we did uh, we were in psych together. I got to bring. I'm not even going to bring it up because he has one of the most insane. Like I can't believe you brought. I'll give you one little. The guy had to do cocaine. So he brought in sugar and snorted it in front of, in the audition. And people are like, what the, fuck? like, he, yeah, yeah. And so he literally sees it. And so the, the whole, the casting directors thought he was snorting cocaine in front of them. And they're like, turn off the camera, turn off the camera right now. And, but he wouldn't stop. Cause he's like, no, I was in it, man. I was in it. And uh, I'll tell you the rest. We'll, we'll get Ken lucky in here another time, but I'll tell you the rest. Of, and it's because what you say, Jocelyn is so true. I'm a minimalist. I don't, I, I bring nothing. I don't even bring my script. A little bit can help you. It's like salt. A little bit always helps. Too much can kind of make the oh, food. Absolutely. 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 Let's jump into let's jump into a couple more things. Um sure. here, and Michael Shirtleff's opinion on eye contact. And I fully agree. Only actors deeply stare into each other's eyes for long period. Yes. Like the and but I feel like so many people say that that's good acting. It's like, hey, look person in the eyes and say your lines. Yeah, but if it's more than a few seconds, it's weird. It's it's very intense. So Michael Shirtleff says, uh, well, he, his, 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 he doesn't really give you any advice. He just says, like, only actors will stare people in the eye, in the eye for, like, super intense periods of time. Actors stare into each other's eyes to indicate they have a relation, having a, they're having a relationship. It's phony. Eyes go out of focus when they look into other eyes for too long. I think of Tom Hardy in Inception. When you first see him, he does the whole scene with Leonardo DiCaprio and all he's doing is eating snacks, physicality, actions, and then looking around in the bar. He almost never makes eye contact. And I, I, for some reason that always stuck out because I remember being an actor and going like, wait, how come he's, he's supposed to look in the other guy? That's what actors do. And then after it, I was like, brilliance. No, I think it goes, it, I think it goes back to what are, you, what are you wanting to do in the scene? And, and so the fact that, you know, he's eating the peanuts and looking away says a lot about what that relationship is. And yeah. so then if he takes a moment and says, you believe me, don't you about this? And you're looking then then you're looking right into the camera. Boom. Then that's very specific. Yeah. So I think it's like in real life, if you're having an argument with someone, you might be going, I can't believe that you are doing this. I'm leaving you. Right. And for everyone again, that was, I love that. that. That was so good. Jocelyn was like yelling at someone in the corner and then she looked right at me or like on camera and she says, I'm leaving you. And it gave such a different delivery. Yeah. And so that's, you know, I, I think that, you know, when you are and when you're not looking at someone is like, in, you just, you can't think of, am I going to look at him or not look at him unless you get a direction from the director. The, 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 because says, look at him. He, well, because some directors work in very stylized way and they want to get a very specific rhythm and a very specific mm -hmm. tone and mood. So they might ask you to do those kinds of things in a way that might seem bizarre, but that's what they want to create. But other than that, you can't be thinking of, am I looking at them in the face when I'm doing this or not? It's like, what's going on in the scene? Yeah, that's exactly. Is it appropriate that's exactly, or not? That's exactly, that's exactly it. Yeah. And I, yeah. I, you know, see, this is the hard part. You know, we're already been an hour, Jocelyn. This has gone by so fast for me. I know because it's so it's it, when you talk Tim about will take out the boring parts. Huh? Hey, Tim. There were no boring parts. <laughs> there were no boring parts. It's all good. Let me let me throw out a few more. Let me, let's go through a few things that Michael Shirtleff said. And then I want to okay. want to keep delving into some of your personal history and stuff like that. Okay. And so here's, I'm going to do some quick and dirties here. And if you want to throw in a couple of quick little bullets here, jump in. OK. And Tim, okay. of course, we always encourage uh, Tim to say a few things so then I can you know be mean to him. Right. So please feel free, Tim. Feed me. Feed me, babe. Feed me, Seymour. 
Bonus points in the comments. If any listen, one's listening, where did that come from? Feed me, Seymour. Justin, you know? Uh, don't say uh, it. Don't say it. Uh, don't say it. Oh, oh, oh. It's a musical. Hints. There we go. All right. So Michael Shirlet, eye contact. I Use eye contact like salt. A little bit makes it delicious. Too much ruins the dish. That's not for Michael Shirtleff, by the way. If you quote that, that's Ivan wants to eat. <laughs> so this is, and this is the lesbians, whores, and gays are people too. Probably if he wrote the book around now, he might have used different terminology. Well, you know, it's interesting because there are some things and there are even some movies that he refers to that we would Very never hopeful. include yeah. that language or that film or anything in today's world. Yeah. But the moral of the story, I think, when I read that part and I says, um, there's two things here. One, just because someone is a prostitute, don't play the stereotype of what a prostitute is or what a cop is. And I think for our listeners that are extras, and I was an extra for many years, this is a trap a lot of extras fall into, is like they're being like, you're a security guard. And they'll be like, they'll look super scary and mean and intimidating. That's you playing a, that's you playing a part. Uh, listen, everyone, you're, you're all drunk at a party, and they'll all overplay the physicality of being drunk at a party. Whereas Michael Shirtleff is saying, think about, think about uh, many of us, and it goes with the same thing with drinking, we'll try and hide what we're feeling or what we're doing. So don't, don't dress up like a pimp if you're playing a pimp. Play a pimp like you in a normal, as a normal person in a T-shirt. Don't come in chewing bubblegum he says bubblegum is not a character choice stop chewing bubblegum that's not as bad as it used to be when i was learning there was a lot of bubblegum chewing nowadays oh, there was nowadays it's not nowadays i think your phone is the bubblegum being on your phone is not a character choice i feel like that personally and then the other thing he mentions when he talks about if you're playing gay if you're playing uh, a prostitute and stuff like that a don't play the caricature in terms of your delivery and b don't play the character in terms of of your clothing and your attire so the the big thing he says is like look in this class and Justin, you took a class with him i think he probably would have like 50 people in the class mm -hmm. there's gay people here there might be prostitutes here can you pick them up of course not no i i i'll, I'll let you finish no please don't comment. no Justin. Well, I I think you have to go back to, you know, what what is required by the scene. Um, let's say you are playing a prostitute. Are you playing the prostitute that's at home making breakfast for her daughter that morning? Or are you on the corner of the street where you do have to dress? You do have to dress that way because that's what you're required to wear when you go out and wear. That's what the pimp wants you yeah. to be wearing. So I think that you have to, and I mean, you know, you can just walk down certain streets and go see what they're wearing. And, you know, there are certain things that are typical. Um, and, and, and so you really have to go back and, and, and look at that. You know, there, there's, you know, a movie recently that I saw and, you know, that's what she does. But on, other than when it's the scenes when she's working, you wouldn't, you wouldn't yeah. know. Yeah. You know, and, and 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 so, you know, and sometimes, you know, depending on what someone does uh, for for a living, they put on a character to be able to go through what the job requirement is. Sure. It's not really themselves. They've created this to be able to get through it. So I think those are the kind, you know, if you're playing, you know, I think a prostitute is a very good example. You, you have to ask yourself, what, what, what is the scene going on? And so I would always suggest, and what I would do is, my younger days, I might have been asked to do that, is if I'm playing the prostitute that it's in the, you know, that's what she does for a living, but she's, the first scene is being the mom, then I'll be dressed like the mom. If there's a different scene, I will take a moment to change. Because it helps you. Because well, and, helps and you. also because I want them to see what the difference is, you know, and I won't have the same makeup on. I won't, you know, might not be showing cleavage. I might not. Do you know what I mean? So, no, yeah, you're it, using. Oh, go you, ahead. It, it, it's like anything else. What's being asked of you in that scene? So the way I always think of it is if you're going to play these kind of archetypal parts, the the uh, Wolf of Wall Street guy, you know what I mean? That's another example. 
if you're going to choose attire and if you're going to choose uh, tropes, like char- like typical character choices, the one thing I always say is, how does that, how is that going to help you? Mm-hmm. Are you doing it for the sake of doing it? Or are you doing it because it helps something in terms of the way you deliver that audition or that role? Yeah. I even had how to then, and that's my big question for everything. When people say like, where are you? I'm in the bedroom. How does that help you? And it's not mine. It's something actually an acting teacher of mine said, he would always say, well, how does that help you? And I was like, I don't know. I just thought it should be in a bedroom. Why does that, if it doesn't help you, then it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Next up we have, oh, this is one well, of my and favorite. I think also I, just one more thing. Yeah. That's why as actors, you know, walk around looking around. You know, well, I have a good story. I have a good story. Sometimes I'll see somebody and they have this walk, a very particular walk that I've never seen anybody just in mm-hmm. the way that they and I'm like, OK, I'm going to watch them for a bit because I want this in my brain because I, I might bring that in sometimes, you know, watch people in different situations, you know, watch you know, where you live and, and how you live, like, how does that affect certain people in society talk a certain way, so yeah. really observe, and then bring that in. Because nothing is bigger, nothing is more shocking, nothing is more beautiful, nothing is more anything than real life. Mm-hmm. So be be an observer of life. I think that's and what a joy to be, you know, what a great thing to do. If you're sitting on the subway, sit so you can watch people coming in <laughs> and you know and I, I, have watch two, them. I have two stories about this and actually there's there's one tim oh God, i think it's it's a michael kane film that was at can you try and look it up real quick for us it's a michael kane film that was at tiff maybe two or three years ago and it's about him being in like a retire harvey Keitel is in it too and he's in um like a wellness retreat okay yeah? oh that sounds fantastic yeah it was it was really good uh, I, um, but so one of my old acting teachers said he had to play this part where he was like a mafioso, you know, an Italian mafioso guy. So the trope was that everyone was going to show up in. Thank you, Tim. Look at that. That's why we pay you the no bucks. <laughs> he, did, he just sent me the name of it and I'll tell you in a minute. But he said, you know what I did? I, I put on like this kind of 1970s really tight shirt. I went, I, he's like, I went, like I, I looked at pictures of Italian guys in Montreal. That's what he told me. Because there, there's a very Italian vibe. There's an Italian area in Montreal that's like Italiano. It's where my dad was born. There, okay. And so, you know, he put on the gold, a gold crucifix, right? And he put on some track pants, like some like old school deep tap pants. And, um, and he says, and I went and bought fruit in an Italian neighborhood. And I watched some of these other guys, you know, and I, you know, these guys walk around in the summertime and they're buying fruit. You know, and that's how he found he tried to embrace that kind of realness so that his choice was not there was a physical choice. There was a look to it, but it was founded in something and it helped his performance. Mm-hmm. And in youth, Michael, there's a character and I don't want to give this too much away. There's a character who's a who's an actor doing a big famous part. And he does that throughout the movie and you don't find out until the end. And then it be the whole audience is like, you sneaky fuck walking around observing things and taking things. And I think you should all watch it just for that. Because that moment as an actor, I was like, oh, you sneaky fuck. Look at you. It was great. Yeah. So moving on, because Jocelyn, this has been great, but I want to make sure we're respectful of your time. I'm let me fun. Let me, I'm having fun. You're having fun? Good. Okay. Yeah. Two other things. Number one, don't be afraid to be a jerk, is basically what Michael Shirtleff is saying. He's saying revenge is an important motivation. He talks about a a film in which this really handsome man pretends that he's interested in the maid just to mess with her. And you can be like, well, that's so mean. Why would he do that? Hey, listen, I've had my heart broken and I'm guilty of like the next girl I meet being a little mean so I can break her heart because it makes me feel better because deep down inside, I'm an asshole. And sometimes that's reality, isn't it? And he says this, he says, revenge is an important motivation. When we are deeply hurt, we want to hurt back. Oh, yeah. Um, We take things out on others. We are so anxious to think well of ourselves that we blind ourselves to the true behavior of human beings. Mm -hmm. So as an actor, don't put your values onto the character. Don't think, oh, my character is being so mean thing. No, I deserve to be this mean. You know, many a self-made important executive is the result of being overlooked as a child is another fun little line he had in that. So and that and that's why they're dicks, because their dad didn't love them. 
Isn't all our creative work the achievement of revenge against doubting Thomases, which is an expression against people who doubted us? And I'll tell you, yeah. yes. Because there are so many people who motivate me because they were so mean to me. And I'm like, oh, one day, one day you're going to, I'm going to, you're, the, you're, I'll give you one quick one. I was a dancer in a, in a TV show. The partner I was dancing with was terrible to me. It was just a mean, not nice person to me. And I was like, I can't wait till I get to that next level and have to do another dancing thing so you can see it. And if you're ever there, I'm going to be like, no, watch me. And it's, it was a motivator and it's a terrible thing to say. But my, my urge to like make her look bad and be, have revenge motivated me. And that's what characters do too. Well, uh, yeah, like, like, like real life. And Jocelyn, when have you ever seduced someone? You mean in a, in a scene or in life? You decide. <laughs> you can, and I know this is the first time. I, I, it's I, not I, something I'm first. very. I, it's not something I'm very good at. So. Well, you know, Michael Shirtlove says seduction is phony, and he makes a very good point here. He says the like you know when we think of seduction, oh, you have to seduce someone in the scene. We all of a sudden we become Don Juan, right? And it's like you look in their eyes and you you get touchy and you get very like sexual and sensual. See, but, I've never I've never played those characters, Yvonne. I've never been asked to be that person, that woman. Well, here's what Michael Shirtleff says. He says that person doesn't exist. He says like if, well, um, if well, hold Mrs. on, hold on, hold on. Robinson, Mrs. Robinson. Oh, but that's you're using the exception for the rule. <laughs> but let me let's. I, I agree with you. But let's see. Let's. Let, this is not me now. This is Michael Shirtleff. He says, um, the. I think seduce is a word we use about other people, not about ourselves. We may think I'd like to go to bed with someone tonight, but the concept of seducing is not a true one at most. Is not a true one for most. If you think about characters, if you use seeking of warmth and union with another human being, the result can be likable and that can be seduction. Even when you're casting a villain, if we cast cleverly, we want someone who can fool other people into thinking they're sincere. That is seduction. I agree. I agree. I, I mean, I think that, um, you know, it, when asked to do that, it can be just the way you lean into that person a little closer. It can be that when you're talking, you touch their knee or you touch. So there, there are different ways as opposed to playing the seducer. Again, activity and business. Activity, activity and, business. and business. And let me give you two quick examples. Uh, what's that indecent proposal? Robert Redford seduces Demi Moore, but it's never sexual. It's a different kind of seduction. La grande seduction. Uh, mm -hmm. The Grand Seduction in English, originally a Quebec film, everyone. It's all about seducing a doctor in all these different ways. And seduction yeah. is trying to create a union. So we're almost out of time. Jocelyn, I want to throw in a few things for you here. Sure. First, can we talk maybe a few minutes about the difference between the Quebec, like the French-Canadian film scene and the English film scene? Because... It is tying the French Canadian film is a is like in Canada, like none of us, no English Canadians ever watch French Canadian films. But in Quebec, you can you're like a, there's like 10 people and they're in every movie. It's they have a huge market. Most Canadians don't watch English Canadian films. But in Quebec, a French Canadian romantic comedy, boom, that's that's going head to head with a Jennifer Aniston film every day. What are you, can you talk to a little bit about the industries? Cause you work in French and in English. Mm -hmm. What are some of the differences in the industries that you have found and some of the challenges and advantages? Well, it's been really interesting because I would say in the last four years, I've probably worked in French Canada more than I have in English Canada. Way less competition. Even, even, even in Ontario. Uh, no, I like to think it's because I'm good, not because well, no, oh, there's less oh, competition. Of course you're good. Of course uh, you're good. Of course you're good. Oh, no. Be, no Podcast is ruined. The, the reason I say that is when you're going up for a French-Canadian role, you're actually going up against a lot of people. Because there's a lot of, you know, actresses in, 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 in Quebec, and a lot of them are very well known. Um, so, the, you know, the, the competition is there. 
and I've been trying to figure it out because this year I've gotten three recurring roles in in French series. Wow. Um, last year, two years ago, I went to Berlin with a feature film that I did in Quebec. I did another feature film. I got recurring roles in uh, another series, and I played one of the original cast members in Appel Moi Si Tu Mar. C'est comme ça que je t'aime is actually on CBC Jam called Happy Great show. Married. Great show. And I was trying to think, like, why am I being even called in to audition for these roles where there's already a lot of actresses? And the one thing that hit me is that in French Canada, or in, in yeah, in French Canada, just not Quebec, even in the Franco Ontarien world, I'm an actor. I look like this, but I'm I'm an actor. I'm now when I look at a lot of the work in English, I'm considered ethnic actor in English. You play the you play the stereo the Italian mom, for example. Italian, the Italian, Spanish, Jewish, uh, Greek. You have that look. You have right. And so many right. takedowns so, have that. Right. So not all of the roles, like, you know, the prime no. minister of France, but that was anybody who spoke French was brought in to audition for that. Like, right. Um, I'm not looked upon like that. None, none of them are based on my, none of my, well, some of them, but I'm not being called on to audition for many roles because of my Italian heritage. It doesn't come. Yeah. So that was it just hit me this this year wow. when I started looking at the at the different opportunities. Um, so so that's you know, that's the one that's the one thing. Um, what's also interesting in Quebec is, you know, I've already done enough work for people to know me. And I I've been here in English Canada for a much longer but you're more of a, yeah. And I think that's what I meant to say in terms of like less competition. Oh, Jocelyn, I'm so bad. Tim, I blame you for not warning me to not say that. You should have been, I should have been reading my mind, Tim. That's, that's the beauty of having a producer. You blame him for everything. But the smaller market means that when you become a known actor there, because there is a smaller market there, people be like, oh, let's bring Jocelyn in. We know what yes. she, let's do that. Yeah, Where, and, and that is happening. And because the, because in Toronto and Ontario, in the rest of Canada, we're doing LA films, not mm -hmm. out of the town. We're, we're doing all American stuff. So for them, we're just like the tax credit actors, as you know, for lack of a, two lines here, three lines there. I love there. that expression. That's you like that? I just made that up. I just, we're the tax credit actors. And that's the realities of, of, the, of the English Canadian scene. But in Quebec, it's a smaller market. And so you have a greater off of duty potentially to, to really be an actor. Yeah. Not to be Italian mom for the star. Yeah. And that's the line. And I, and I, and you know, and I can be, and I mean, you know, uh, playing La Mama in, you know, La Mama in Appel Moi Si Tu Mar was because, you know, that was specifically, I mean, it's about a mafioso comp uh, family yeah. and, you know, you needed to, to be Italian. You needed to have an authentic Italian accent when you speak French, which is what I grew up with hearing. I grew up hearing and that's People a very Montreal, French Italian, Italian, French yeah, it's accent. A very, yeah. It's a very specific accent, right? So that was because, but it was a huge, it was a huge role. And, it, and again, it was producer network going, well, she's not a star. And the lead actor, who's a huge star in Quebec saying, you already have two huge stars in the show. She's the right one for the part. Come on. Bravo. And so I played it and, it, and, and you know, and, and, it, and it worked out. Uh, so I am really enjoying both. I love speaking French. So I love playing the French characters. I've been offered so many fantastic, wonderful roles from comedy to drama. Uh, and I, in the last few years, I've also enjoyed, you know, getting to be on Schitt's Creek and, 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 and getting to face off with, with Kiefer Sutherland, you know, and I just worked with Rossif. So now all I need is the dad and I've got the trio. There, um, and, you know, and here's, here's something I just said to and jump in on here. Justin, yes. Is it because 
as actors, we have to be very, we have to be kind of critical of ourselves and cold hearted sometimes when we look at ourselves as like a product as, you know, not just an emotional and you're finding all the success in this older demographic. And sometimes we're afraid, to, like, you know, I'm not going to be the heartthrob anymore. You know what I mean? And there's a lot of, I, was. well, especially for female actors, you know, there's a concept of like, I can't believe I'm playing the grandma, but there's so many opportunities because here's something uh, Dan Wilmot, a, a good friend and former guest of the show was saying, you know, when you get, as you start getting older, there's less and less new people. There's more like of these veteran actors, you know what I mean? And so the opportunities can grow. And that's something that you're experiencing. Yeah. And, and I do think that there's, I mean, I, you know, I worked and then I didn't work and then it was up and down and, and, and all of a sudden I'm working and it is all of these, these older, older women. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think that it's also because they're being written in again. There's you more know, parts to play for the, older women. The older aunt, the grandmother, yeah. the 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 kind of weird little lady that you know lives across the street in the old folks' homes. Like all of these, you know, the the mother-in-law, they're they're being they're being brought in, and that is a reality. Um, and especially if you look at Italian families, you know, I can speak for that. That. The, the intergenerational life yeah. is very connected. So to have an older character in a storyline like that, you will see more. That's great. Because they might, they might live in what is called in Montreal, the in-law suite. The like house they don't have that the, as much here in Ontario. The ground floor above where the can, other people live. Yeah. You know, they actually sell them like that now. Did that that's how they market them, the in-law suites. So that's where the, you know, the mom and dad, the grandmother, grandfather, they live in that part. And then the family lives in the other part. They sell them like that, right? So, so I think the big thing we fun. can take we the big thing we can take away is that A, you got to embrace the roles. And if you're playing, don't be afraid to age. Don't be afraid. You we don't youthful youth is overrated sometimes, especially as actors. Your look doesn't have to be beautiful and young forever. You're beautiful it's, and young sometimes and old and craggy other times. In it's it's interesting because it's different. You know, I, I've always been the character actor. I've never been, you know, Me too. The, yeah. the pretty girl in the film. Never the star. Never, you know. The stars are archetypes. Um, and, and so I didn't have to face the... I'm losing my looks and I got my parts because I'm talented, but also pretty, not pretty, both same talent, pretty will win. So as you get older, when you lose that, it is more difficult because it's already difficult even when you're a character actor to see yourself aging on, on, on screen. So I think depending on where you're coming from and, and, you know, what was offered to you and why it was offered to you earlier on in your career, you're going to live it differently, especially for women as you as you get older. What I find is the saddest in actresses who have wanted to stay or, you know, at some point they just couldn't deal with what was happening is at, at auditions and stuff. Like, it's th this bitterness and this this anger and, and they're bitter because they didn't get what they should have gotten and I don't believe I got what I deserved I believe that I deserve more and better roles but I'm not bitter because it doesn't serve me and so you, one has to be really careful with that energy because it comes into the audition it comes into the audition so do it and continue doing it, make sure you still love it. Make sure you still love it. I, I, and, and I think that that's what's going to help you through the ups and the downs. I mean, two years without working, I could have got really bitter. <laughs> and I, you know what, I think that's maybe a great way for us to jump in and, and kind of, and kind of
end off for today. The, uh, because that is also another thing that you need to be as an actor is you need to have that mental toughness to not get embittered because your life is a life of failures. <laughs> Most auditions you won't get. You may not act for years on a time, but if you can find A, not dwelling on that, and B, find other things in your life that bring you value and other ways to express yourself, you come into the auditions as a positive force. And that's, we have to remember, actors who are listening, it's not just, can they play the part? It's, do I want to work with you? Mm -hmm. So I would always work with Jocelyn. We've actually been in a couple of shows together, but never at the same time. Yeah, exactly. Literally, I've been in the same episodes with you on things, but I never know. at the same time. I know. I but know. hopefully one day soon, we will get together and actually be performing scenes. Be great. I'd love to do that. In fact, you know, the next time you're not acting for two years, you know, this whole podcast is a joint production between Radio Radio.com, the mighty Tim McClarty, who is our producer. He makes podcasts if, for anyone listening and of the actress place. And I don't know, Jocelyn, if you know this, but this is our acting collective where we get together and we just practice acting. It's not classes. We just sit there and we exchange. We run scenes and we practice. Oh, wow. That's great. And so often there's been times where I was not an actor for six, seven, eight, nine months. And I was so afraid of my audition because I was rusty. But because of this collective, we get together a couple of times a week and we just act. And, I'm, oh, and it always helps you feel loose. So open invitation to Jocelyn. If you want to come, you. you can come anytime you want. For Thank all our you. listeners, you are all welcome to come to The Actors Place and do our virtual sessions for now. Theactorsplace.org is the website. Jocelyn, anything you want to plug, you can look her up and we'll print her name out. Check her out on IMDb. Watch Designated Survivor for the French Ambassador. Yes, that is actually it's called uh, Bombshell and it's episode 20 or 21 in season one. Shits Creek is called Roadkill in season five. Sikam uh, Sukashtem is on CBC Gem. And uh, uh, other things can be found on all of the streamers, but uh, you, we'll you, make sure you know, to share your IMDb link so everyone can watch. Uh, Urban yeah. Angel, Urban Angel, Urban Angel, Urban Angel. Check out the hair Check from out 1989. Hair. Ladies and yeah. gentlemen, thank you all so much for joining us again thank for you. the ladies. Thank so you, so Justin, for all the great stuff. Thank you, Tim. We're almost you, done Yvonne. the book. We're almost done the book, and we couldn't have done it without you, Jocelyn. Thank you for coming. Oh, it's great time fun. By. The time flew by, and you're a beautiful guest, and so much to learn from you. So thank you. Thank you. Anytime. And that's it, ladies and gentlemen, for okay. The Lazy Actor. Thank you so much, Tim McClarty, RadioRadio.com. Thanks to TheActorsPlace.org. You lazy, lazy actors. You should have listened to this whole episode so I could <laughs> reprimand you at the end. If you got to this end of the episode, you lazy bastards, give us a like, put some comments in. We will see you next time for The Lazy Actor. Bye, everybody. Au revoir.